I was the only animal rights activist in my fifth grade class. Free Willy was my favorite movie. I even adopted a whale, which meant I paid $20 a month for a picture of a whale. And I spent my recesses writing poems about ending animal cruelty. Let the others play pogs. I had purpose. Our teacher, our teacher assigned us a project requiring a presentation about marine mammals. It was my time to shine the light on the world. I'd seen enough Saved by the Bell to know that if you really wanted to get through to the youth of America, it needed to be by rapping. <laughs> needed to know about the cruelty of harpooning. With my propensity for prose, I composed a rap put to the melody of Tone Loke's Wild Thing. The following afternoon, everyone took turns sharing their presentations. It was to my classmates' good fortune that I was last. This would be a tough act to follow. I made my way to the front of the room, turned my back to my audience, pulled my baseball cap to the side of my head, and began beatboxing. Let's do it. Whaling whales. Whaling whales. Wake up, whalers, and smell the sea. It's time to come to reality. Versus, expecting heads to be bobbed into the beat and nods in agreement, but it was a live collage of puckered lips holding in laughter and puzzled expressions. I stood with my arms crossed over my chest, awaiting congratulatory cheers from my classmates, but it was replaced with sympathetic slow clapping. I felt betrayed by A.C. Slater. Clearly, no other 11-year-olds were concerned about animal rights, and they had no reservations reminding me of that daily. I wanted summer to come more than I wanted an honorable mention from Greenpeace. I wanted a new class and a chance to form a new reputation, and I got that. In the center of a web threaded with teen spirit in Noxima was Jasmine Gale. On the other side of the chain link fence, she wouldn't have stopped traffic, but she was the Alicia Silverstone of our school. <laughs> I thought popularity worked like an extensive game of telephone, and if you were fortunate enough, people whispered good things about you that would get passed along until every person knew how fabulous you were, like PR for middle school. <laughs> Jasmine Gale had impeccable PR, and it was as though she never even wanted it in the first place. And she'd be perfectly fine without the cool girl label. Like she was playing hard to get with society. <laughs> I wanted to know what it was like to capture everyone's attention to a degree in which it became a necessity. Last year, my PR consisted of referring to me as blubber lover. Any example Jasmine was setting was one to be followed. I tore apart Miller's outpost searching for anything I'd seen Jasmine. Oh my god. Baby doll tees, baggy jeans, knockoff CK1. She showed midriff. I showed modesty. I sought out any opportunity to talk to her, pretending we coincidentally had the same taste in everything because my entire reputation relied on her approval. I was laying out my outfit on a school night, and the phone rang. Hello? Hey, it's Jazz. Jazz? Jasmine? Jasmine was calling me? What could this be about? Maybe the word got out about my rap last year, and maybe she's more awesome than I thought, and she wants to come over and watch Free Willy. <laughs> Hello? She said, hi! Sorry. What's up? <laughs> Want to walk to 7-Eleven with us after school? Tomorrow? <gasps> um, yeah, sure. <laughs> cool. We'll meet at the front gate. See ya. Okay, yeah, cool. I mean, whatever. 
I nearly stayed up all night prepping myself for our hangout. I memorized facts about pop culture, impressions, and jokes. Jasmine and her group and I hung out until 5.30 the night. The street lights came on as I walked home Friday night. I earned myself a regular invitation to the 7-Eleven hangout sessions. But our friendship didn't stop at Slurpees and Big Gulps. They'd even talk to me at school. Jasmine was the first to get a boyfriend. After one week, Tom and her were in a very serious relationship. <laughs> They'd make out everywhere. And in front of anyone, I'd never seen such passion. <laughs> but then one day, Jasmine showed up crying, which I didn't even think was a possibility. People like her didn't get hurt because nobody would be bold enough to hurt them in the first place. But Tom was. He broke it off with her, and she was destroyed over it. You're too good for him, I said, realizing moments later that I'd be completely screwed if they got back together. <laughs> I mean, you go, girl! <laughs> Here's the thing, Jasmine said as she brushed her bangs away from her face and blotted her Maybelline teardrops. <laughs> You're really nice but you're just a little too perky to have around. You just don't get what it's like to have problems. We're on a deeper level than you. What? Too happy. I haven't always been this happy, and I was only happy because she was my friend, and as a result, other people were nice to me too, and it made me feel special. This happiness was her fault. I was too so sad. <laughs> I wanted to tell her she was wrong, that I wasn't happy. I wanted her to like me, so I said nothing. After homeroom, Jasmine's gang circled around her as usual, but they were staring at her hand. It's the letter T. I did it with my compass. I want him to know I'll never forget him. Jasmine was wiping up the blood around the letter she carved into her skin. Her posse followed her, and they set off for 7-Eleven. Don't they understand that I'm actually a really deep person? I've got lots to be sad about. I'll show them how troubled I am, and I'll top Jasmine's pathetic letter T on her hand, and I'll do it right below my wrist, just to prove how much of a badass I actually am. But whose initials should I use? Not someone from our school. That might make them feel uncomfortable. Jim Dillon. I've never met him, but Jasmine said he's really hot. This isn't only edgy, it's also an insanely romantic gesture. Once he finds out, he'll totally want to meet the girl that carved his initials into her arm. I took a Sharpie and drew a bubble letter J and D on my forearm right below my wrist. I searched my mom's jewelry box and found my old diaper pin my mom saved. I ran an alcoholic wipe over it and began penetrating my skin with it. I push really hard, but the cut isn't nearly deep enough. I could have done that with my finger now. I pillage through drawers throughout her house and locate an X-Acto knife. Oh. <laughs> and start carving the letter J into my it hurts. It burns like lemon juice on a paper cut. My blood is oozing over the carved lines in unison with the sweat running down my forehead. J and half of D, but my skin keeps pinching up as I turn the blade to make the curve. Six more attempts and a sliver away from my veins. A crooked letter D is complete. I bandage my arm with gauze from my play veterinarian set. <laughs> In between classes, I pull up my sleeves and my sweaty bandage drops on the floor, right in sync with Jasmine passing by. What the hell is that? She asks. Nothing, which was code for, wouldn't you like to know? <laughs> she grabbed my arm and let out a sharply drawn breath. Oh my God, did you do this? Why did you do this? Who's this for? Hell yeah, I did it. Jim Dillon. 
I'm not perky like you think, you know, I said. Her crew walks up, used the mutilation adorned on my arm, and begins whispering. That's disgusting. You've never even met him. You're one screwed up bitch. Yes, yes they get it. I am not too perky to have her. It's working. <laughs> And just as I'm about to ask them if we're still on for 7-Eleven after school today, they're gone. By 2 o'clock, I'm in the counselor's office talking about my compulsion to cut. And there isn't any sane way to explain why I did that. <laughs> she gives me some reading material. And I go home. <laughs> My mom and dad are standing in the living room. My dad has my bedroom doorknob and a screwdriver in his hand. The school counselor called, let us see your arm, my mom said. J.D.? James Dean? <laughs> really? The guy is dead. <laughs> what compelled you to do this, my dad said. You know what? No, he continued. Here's the deal. We're keeping your door knob. You can't lock yourself in anymore. You'll get it back once we can see that you're past this. It's gonna scar if you keep doing it. And then the only way to get rid of it is a skin graft. Do you know what that is? He said. No, I said. It's where a surgeon scrapes the skin off of your ass and puts it on your arm to cover up the scar. Is that what you want? You want to walk around with your ass skin on your arm for the rest of your life? to have the skin scraped off of your ass really puts things into perspective. <laughs> I do as I'm told. Put Neosporin on my arm and bandage it up. My parents check it every day to make sure I'm not reopening it. Without my 7-Eleven attendance, I've started writing poetry again. Not about animals, about my feelings. Me, a poem I write about my insecurities, gets published in the school zine and I've never felt so proud. These are my thoughts, and my peers admire them. All eyes on me, and I love it. But I get called into the counselor's office with Jasmine after school, and I have no idea why. Now, I called both of you girls here because Jasmine has something she wants to talk to you about. First of all, I just want to say that I really love the poem that was published in the zine. I love it because I wrote it. That's a lie. I wrote it. The poem is called Me. It's about my pain. <laughs> we continue arguing, and the counselor decides that since she could not prove I stole it, I can leave. I'm so mad I want to spit on Jasmine. I want to tell the entire school how ugly of a person she is. But she has her followers. I spent half a year trying to steal her style and popularity, but she'd stolen something so much more valuable my thoughts. At home, I tell my parents the truth, and we piece together why I did what I did. I get my doorknob back and let the scars heal. I continue writing, not for recognition, for survival, for closure. But sometimes, in certain light, I can still see the curve from the letter D on my right arm. Esther Woodman.